Hello uh, to everybody. Uh, welcome to the last DCARB CH lunch talk of the year. My name is Gianfranco Guidati. As usual, I will uh, guide you through this uh, through this presentation today. Today we have a, I mean, a, the, the title alone speaks for itself. There's not much more I want to add, really. A revolutionary energy storage cycle with carbon-free aluminium. You really set the bar high, Yvonne. We are all very excited to, to learn now what this is about. So the speaker is Yvonne Boyle from, from OST, from the Solar Technology Institute. So with this, I would like to hand over to Yvonne. We are very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Jean Franco. So I'm a project leader at SPF, and my key topics here are long-term energy storage with a focus on renewable metal fuels, um, power to X, and thermal storage. We also operate a fuel cell test bench, uh, and I'm um, one of my favorite topics is life cycle assessment. I did my master thesis on it, and uh, it can be applied in so many um, um, for so many applications and products. And um, yeah, since my background is, is energy systems, uh, uh, so this goes very good. I, I like to apply this for the energy systems in general. So today I'm happy to present our Horizon Euro project, Reveal, uh, where we develop an energy uh, storage cycle based on renewable metal fuels, um, which in our case is aluminum. First of all, I go into the mode motivation and I go into the concept and later a little bit into the details. Uh, but uh, because it's a, it's a, a kind of a new topic, I kind of, um, the details uh, will be, um, yeah, just a little bit. And I try to uh, make it understandable why we're going this route and what's it good for and so on and so forth. So here you see a graph of the annual distribution of space heat demand in Europe. Um, it's a geographical weather dependent model for calculating the heat demand using a temporal resolution of an hour with a spatial re resolution of 40 times 40 square kilometers. It only uses temperature uh, variations uh, for calculating the space heat demand. Um, so space heat depends on climate and weather or basically on the annual heating degree days, but also on the population density and heat losses of buildings. I like to point out that um, fossil fuel is still accounted for 63% of the global energy use for building related heating in 2022, which emits a total of 4,000 or 100 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. Now, let's have a look at the Swiss share of heat in the final um, energy demand. In 2022, nearly 50% can be attributed to heat generation. 18% goes for uh, electricity and 34% for the transport sector. However, we're now very interested uh, in the winter. How about uh, January 2022? Then it's even 65% uh, of the final energy demand that is for heat. 30% uh, electricity and 23% for uh, the transportation. You all know the uh, Swiss energy perspective for decarbonization uh, scenario, but this is um, an EU project. Uh, so I, I normally introduce that too. Let's have uh, that for like a quick look into it. We see here the Swiss gross electricity generation and consumption split into the winter and summer half. Overall, we can say the electricity demand keeps increasing uh, due to electrification with heat pumps and battery electric vehicles. The nuclear electricity will be replaced by renewables and there will be a slight increase in hydropower generation uh, to terawatt hours was agreed on. And we expect in 2050 that 34 terawatt hour of electricity will be uh, generated from, from PV. 70% of those systems will be operated with batteries. A surplus of PV electricity is therefore generated in the summer of um, in 2015, uh, nine terawatt hours. However, in the winter, um, a power deficit of 9 terawatt hours is expected in 2050. 
um, which is then imported in the form of electricity and power to X options. And we're focused now on the question, how can this summer energy be transported into the winter? And uh, looking at the technologies that are, are available, um, of course, uh, we're talking about uh, large capacities and long-term storage. Um, there is um, the long-term thermal energy storage options, which are very interested for district heating applications. We see here a picture of uh, pit storage. The implementations of these projects depend on local conditions and regulations. And generally, and in Switzerland, uh, space is limited and regulations are very restrictive. But lately, there is some development and um, some very, very interesting projects um, where uh, such um, storage options will be implemented. The other option is the synthetic fuel, methan, methanol. Uh, this, uh, stor the storage of it is uh, state-of-the-art. And also that the technology for the green production of methane and methanol has, has progressed, but it needs a CO2 source. And uh, this application is most interesting for the industry. And last but not least, the renewable metal fuels, um, where solutions are developed for buildings and industrial applications, uh, mainly with aluminum and iron, um, and we hear more about that. However, the TRL um, is rather low, um, around four to five, like the, with the overall uh, redox cycle. Now, what's our vision? If let's um, ask ourselves, how do we heat our homes in the winter without when there's no um, uh, district heating network available uh, in the past, or let's say, your uh, winter heat demand is 11 megawatt hours for your home. Um, in the past, we, bought, we burnt uh, heating oil and emitted um, annually 2.9 ton of CO2, which required about one cubic meter of heating oil. Today, there is renewable options. We can uh, store solar thermal or PV electricity. However, we see that uh, storage volumes are rather large and also result, result then of course into uh, high investment costs. And our vision is now um, additionally to the heat pump systems um, and short term storage options that in your home you have a CHP unit that uh, generates this winter heat and power peaks um, uh, demand uh, from renewable metal fuels in the, uh, for example, aluminium uh, from aluminium granulate, then about even less uh, storage volume is required compared uh, to heating oil. Which metals are suitable? Um, Peterson uh, did an overview and uh, showed here the periodic system with green elements that are interesting candidates uh, in gold. Uh, those metals are too expensive or rare, and in yellow, those are uh, toxic or, or uh, like it's metals or, or oxide. So we further selected here um, um, these elements, and we said, well, for a long-term storage, lithium is um, very expensive, expensive and rare, um, and only interesting for short-term storage. Sodium, potassium, and calcium. Uh, is too reactive, uh, so it's a safety issue. Uh, we didn't consider those. Uh, titanium is not uh, reactive enough and expensive, and copper and boron is expensive and rare as well. Leaving um, magnesium, manganese, iron, um, zinc, aluminium, and silicon as um, interesting candidates for us. We did um, an evaluation uh, criteria on the volumetric storage density, cost, abundance in the Earth's crust, existing world reserves, and feasibility of the additional uh, production for these uh, renewable um, metal fuel um, um, cycles. And the most promising candidates are, in this case, aluminum, iron, and silicon. Now, 
these were findings from a different project, from our uh, uh, peak metal project. And um, uh, with Reveal, we already um, went with aluminium for the following reasons. Um, first of all, it has extreme high volumetric energy density. And I like to point out here that the alternative power to X options uh, with the, the gravimetric energy density is shown here without a storage container. And considering the weight of those storage containers that are necessary, the value um, here is reduced as well. Now, aluminum is, um, has a high availability. It's uh, the most abundant element on the Earth's crust. Um, it has a 10 times higher um, its availability than uh, lithium, for example, uh, sorry, 10,000 times um, higher than uh, lithium. It has low storage cost. Uh, one kilogram is about two euros. With lithium, it's uh, more than 30 uh, euros per kilogram. It has safe handling, non, it's not toxic, uh, and its bulk material is not flammable. It's uh, easy to store and transport, uh, loss-free, um, and no pressure tanks or, or even cryogenic tanks are required. And it has a flexible application as a remeth, because as I pointed out already, there's compared to synthetic fuels, in this case, there's no carbon uh, source required. Also for the, um, for the application, the temperature level um, of the heat that's been produced is not limited. Uh, we see that later. And uh, even small scale CHP applications are feasible. Now, the concept is that in the summer, aluminum oxide is uh, being reduced uh, by only renewable energy emitting oxygen. We call this process a power to X and it's an industrial process. And um, so basically uh, it's a CO2 free uh, production of aluminium where aluminium is our energy carrier. And in the winter when um, those peak demands are required, we can let it, the aluminium react with water uh, which releases hydrogen and heat. The hydrogen then uh, can be directly converted in fuel cell system to more heat, usable heat, uh, plus um, electricity. Uh, this process we call aluminium to energy. And this is, uh, so this is the, the one that will be in the CHP unit in your home being operated. Now, the concept is based on aluminium as a seasonal energy carrier, um, carbon-free aluminium oxide uh, reduction, and um, the aluminium water oxidation producing heat and hydrogen. And um, it does not only produce energy, but um, also the reaction product of this oxidation reaction is, again, our initial material, um, aluminium oxide or hydroxide, uh, which will be recycled then um, in the summer again. So it's a circular economy um, concept. Now, at SPF, um, uh, we're doing uh, research and development for the L2 energy uh, process. So the one for the CHP units in your home. We started with the HEPO style project in 2018, which was a feasibility study. And it showed that the concept was very interesting. So we kept going um, and did a hybrid stock project where we develop and tested a batch setup. We continued then um, with our Allen Cycles project where we studied and analyzed options for using waste aluminum streams. Uh, we see some results later of that. Um, and um, now we're just finishing up our Allo CHP project where we developed, built, and tested a pilot plant um, for a continuous operation. And um, since June last year, we started our uh, EU project, Reveal, where we closed the energy uh, storage cycle by developing 
uh, the power to aluminium process. So here we have experts uh, in our consortium from the aluminium industry. Um, we have nine partners from seven European countries, from Iceland, Slovenia, and so on. There's several experts from the aluminium industry. Um, we see that later for the CO2-free aluminium um, production process, so the power, power to aluminium process, but also fuel cells engineers, uh, IHA group, um, and life cycle analysis experts, which is PRE. The budget is 2.5 million uh, from the EU, plus 1 million from uh, the CV. Now we're looking into the, the storage cycle itself. Uh, we see here the power to aluminium process um, with the Arctus, Tech, and Sintef, the partners developing this project, uh, this process. And then we have two pathways, pathways uh, we develop further for the auto energy process. Uh, once with the, with the target application for the industry. This is our partners at NIC in Slovenia. It's the high temperature pathway where aluminium oxide uh, is our reaction product. And um, we have uh, the second pathway where at OST, um, SPF and UMTEC, we develop uh, this pathway for the low temperature uh, first target application. Uh, this produces aluminium hydroxide, which uh, first has to be calcined uh, in order for it to be recycled. I already mentioned that the fuel cell system, um, we have expert here at EHA Group in Lausanne. Um, and this is the application of, uh, for buildings uh, we, we develop here further. Uh, the aim is to build a four kilowatt CHP unit for continuous operation. Because at um, OST, we did not publish yet our new real findings. I have here some results from our Allen Cycles project. Maybe at a later point, uh, I can give another presentation and show some results of this from the reveal. So here, uh, I mentioned already, uh, we looked at options. Uh, we, if we can use uh, waste um, aluminum streams, uh, for example, mixed capsules, uh, beverage cans, or even uh, pre-consumer scrap, uh, such as uh, wet aluminum swarf or dry aluminum swarf. And you can see here the uh, reaction time versus the uh, hydrogen production. Uh, we can see here uh, with the conditions um, um, of six molar uh, sodium hydroxide solution, um, 100% um, yield could be achieved. Yeah, 100% uh, yield could be achieved um, related to aluminum content. But if we look, um, so, so these uh, materials had uh, other impurities such as iron, manganese, copper, um, and so on. And uh, related to the content of reactive metals, we see here in uh, what's that green, the yield that could be reached. For the power to aluminum uh, process with a, with a CO2 free um, uh, emission, this is uh, based on the vertical inert anode and cathode uh, for low temperature electrolyte. So this is uh, electrolysis that uh, has been operated at 800 uh, degrees Celsius and uh, it produces about 99.8% uh, purity of aluminium. The benefits um, compared to a traditional hall herod uh, process uh, which uses uh, carbon anodes so that, which are consumed. So there's a, a large CO2 um, uh, coming from, from the anodes that are being consumed. There's a zero CO2 compliance costs and taxes, 20% less energy required. Uh, there's options for modular power feeding during uh, peak hours and uh, power sh sh shortage periods for optimal power price and 50% less space requirements for the same production capacities. So the cell volume uh, can be reduced uh, uh, quite a bit here, which leads to 40% less investment costs.
And uh, thirty percent less operation costs and no carbon handouts. I already mentioned that. And for this technology, the full commercialization is expected uh, by twenty thirty. So I can summarize. So advantages of the aluminium as renewable metal fuels. Um, it has an extreme high volumetric um, energy density and cost is cost effective. Aluminium is highly abundant and available element. Uh, the production for additional demand of aluminium is feasible. There's no storage losses and simple and safe transport um, and storage. For the power to aluminium process, of course, this only makes sense to do it with a, a, a CO2 free metal production and 100% renewable electricity. The technology for uh, this pathway is expected to reach full com commercialization by 2030. Excuse me. And for the Alto Energy process, we at AUST uh, develop an CHP unit um, in the range of two kilowatts heat and two kilowatts in the form of hydrogen. We can also say per dwelling approximately 50 to 1000 uh, kilogram of aluminium as the storage material are required uh, to cover winter peak demands of homes in Central Europe. This is for new buildings and no passive house. And um, last but not least, uh, the aluminium uh, concept is cost effective to supply a multifamily home with 100% solar heat and electricity and an elect uh, energy cost of less than uh, 20 cents, euro cents per kilowatt hours for end consumers are realistic in 2030. I'd like to point out that, um, yeah, for further results um, and news, uh, follow us on social media. And um, I thank you very much. Thank you, Yvonne.